Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. I have a couple of intimations to intimate. St Mary's Parish Church, temporary change in arrangements due to our area designation changing to level four. As you know, our area has now been designated as level four. This means a change to the maximum number of people who can attend a church service with immediate effect. We have taken the decision to keep the church open for worship, although a maximum of 20 people will be allowed in the sanctuary at any one time. This includes those on duty, the minister and the organist. Bookings for Sunday services should still be made using the usual booking system. When the number of people wishing to book places reaches our legally allowed limit, we would be happy to book a place for them and where appropriate, their partners or household group for the following Sunday service. We will only be using the main entrance. This will reduce the number of elders required and thus maximize places at service for other members of the congregation. These arrangements will remain in place until there is a change to our allocated level. The next intimation is regarding Christmas cards. The church once again will be collecting Christmas cards for delivery in Lenzie, Kirkintilloch, Auchinloch and Waterside. There will be an extra drop off this year as well as Sunday the 29th of November and Sunday the 6th of December for bringing cars to church. You can also hand them in any day to Stuart Walker, the news agent. The price remains at 25 pence per card with all money being given to the church. Cards along with money must be put in a plastic bag. It is important to include a house number when addressing the envelopes thus making it less difficult for those delivering and avoid cards having to be posted. This morning we welcome Douglas Clark back to the pulpit. These are all the intimations for this morning. As we prepare for worship, let us pray. Eternal God, in this old and sacred place, for generation after generation, Jesus has surprised people challenged, inspired, and encouraged them. We are here not to remember the good we have done, but to prepare what we might yet by making room for the Holy Spirit to remold and reshape us. So make this time and place a touching place where Christ can gather us together for God. Amen. Good morning, and thank you, Gary. It's good to be with you once again. And like me, you'll all be longing for a time when we can come to worship once again without any restrictions and belt out the old familiar hymns. We all long for that day, and we hope it won't be too long. The Lord is King forever. He has set up His throne for judgment. He rules the world with righteousness. He judges the nations with justice. The hymn 457, all hail the power of Jesus' name.
From you, Bethlehem, will come a king, one whose origins are far back in the past. He will rise up and lead Israel in the strength of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, we come into your presence, whether we are in our homes or in this building, to worship you and to hear your word to us. We need this time with you because life can be tough, especially in these recent times of uncertainty. And we need to have this time just to rest in your presence and feel you close to us. And even if we just catch a glimpse of your glory through a word or an action, it can be enough to set us out on another week with souls refreshed. So we come to praise you, but from our praise we must come down to the pain of confession. It is when we see how great your love is and how much we've wandered from you, we wonder how on earth we deserve such a love. Lord God, there are times when we lose sight of you. There are times when we forget about you and we get caught up in our routines, our plans, getting on with our lives as best we can, and then something happens. Suddenly our plans change and we know we can do nothing without your help and your guidance in our lives. Loving and forgiving Father, when we forget you, don't forget us. And when we wander far from you, forgive us, turn us around, and bring us back renewed and refreshed to face the world once again. This is our prayer, and we make it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us hear the word of God and the reader this morning will be John Thompson. Today's readings, um, one from the Old Testament, the first one is from the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 8. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 8, and it's entitled, Hope for the Future. How terrible will be the Lord's judgment on those rulers who destroy and scatter his people? This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the rulers who were supposed to take care of his people. You have not taken care of my people. You have scattered them and driven them away. Now I am going to punish you for the evil you have done. I will gather the rest of my people from the countries where I have scattered them, and I will bring them back to their homeland. They will have many children and increase in number. I will appoint rulers to take care of them. My people will no longer be afraid or terrified, and I will not punish them again. I, the Lord, have spoken. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will choose as king a righteous descendant of David. That king will rule wisely and do what is right and just throughout the land. When he is king, the people of Judah will be safe, and the people of Israel will live in peace. He will be called the Lord our salvation. The time is coming, says the Lord, when people will no longer swear by me as the living God 
who brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Instead, they will swear by me as the living God who brought the people of Israel out of a northern land and out of all the other countries where I had scattered them. Then they will live in their own land. And our second reading is from the New Testament, and it is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, and it's entitled, The Final Judgment. When the Son of Man comes as King, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne, and the people of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people on his right, and the others on his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come you that are blessed by my Father. Come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you fed me. Thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you received me in your home. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. In prison, and you visited me. The righteous will then answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes, or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Away from me, you that are under God's curse. Away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you would not feed me. Thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes. Naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refused to help one of these least important ones, you refused to help me. These then will be sent off to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, Lord God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> in this life, we work with two calendars. There are events we celebrate once and once only. They're important events. The day of our wedding, the day our child was born, the day we graduated, the day we passed our driving test. Important days, but when they're gone, they're gone. Our other calendar is a church liturgical calendar, and that calendar has dates like Advent, Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, Ascension, Trinity, and these events come year after year after year. They come back year on year on year. Advent comes year after year, as does Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, Ascension, and Trinity. And this liturgical year ends today. This is the last Sunday in the church year. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday begins Advent, the build-up to Christmas, the beginning of a new church year. So today, Christ the King Sunday is an important Sunday. It's there to remind us that Christ is the King, the King above all other kings. 
Kingship was all through Jesus' life. When he was born, kings brought him gifts. And it all began 12 months ago on the first Sunday in Advent. And with Christians all over the world, we tell the good news that Jesus is coming with Christmas carols, nativity scenes, and the lighting of the Advent candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. Each Sunday in Advent, we proclaim that promise, Jesus is coming. No matter what's happening in the world, that comes year on year. And next week, we start the Advent cycle all over again. So today, the last Sunday in the church year, is not a permanent ending so much as the end of the beginning that started one year ago. Most of us are familiar with the phrase, the beginning of the end, than we are with the phrase, the end of the beginning. And I believe one of the most challenging things for church folk is to let go of our belief in endings. That's the way of the world, of course, to think that everything must come to an end. And when you think about it, these endings cause us great anxiety. You know, the ending of a relationship, the ending of a career, the ending of a ministry, the ending of health, the ending of life. You see, we live in a culture of endings that believe all good things must come to an end. All good things must come to an end. But the gospel of Jesus introduces a different idea. It poses an interesting question that goes something like this. What do you suppose it would be like if you lived in a world that had no endings? What if what seemed to be the ending you encountered in life turned out to be new beginnings? What if human life is no different than the way God has ordered nature with the endings of winter always giving way to the new life of spring? That'd be an interesting world in which to live. <coughs> and we'd have to look at it a lot differently. When it comes close to Christmas, I think it's natural to think about past Christmases. And we've all got our own stories to tell about Christmases past. The memories and the stories that we remember we were told around the dinner table at Christmas time. And as we sat there, sitting at that table on Christmas Day with all these older folks talking and telling their stories. And then in what seems like no time at all, it's you who's the older person telling the stories. And who knows what it's going to be like this year. But it's a wonderful thing to remember the stories of what used to be. The Bible insists that we do it that we recall the good old days and tell the stories to our children and our grandchildren. And you know, I think the remembering of these stories either lead you to think about endings or new beginnings. And that says a lot about our faith and makes all the difference in how we live our life. So are you an endings person or a beginnings person? This was the very same question the prophet Jeremiah faced. His beloved Jerusalem was in ruins, destroyed by the Babylonian armies. The people he loved were scattered, some as refugees escaping the fighting, others as prisoners of war, taken into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah wept as he remembered the good old days. Jerusalem in all its splendor, her people in all their vitality, his friends and family members and all they meant to him. But it was all gone now. And Jeremiah was angry about that. And especially he was upset with the religious leaders and politicians who'd led the people astray and got them into this tragic mess. Oh, for a return to the good old days. But the word from God that came to Jeremiah did not speak of the end of Jerusalem or the end of God's people 
or the end of hope. The word that came to Jeremiah spoke of new beginnings. And this is what God said. I will gather the rest of my people from the countries where I've scattered them and will bring them back to their homeland where they will increase in number and I will appoint rulers to take care of them. So what does that mean? What's this all about? Well, <clears throat> this is certainly not how Jeremiah intended it. But these words were meant to speak to Jeremiah personally. Maybe they speak personally to us as well. And I have to confess, I'm not sure of the theology behind this, but this is the way I see it. This time of the year is full of memories. Can you think of anyone you know who's scattered and lost? Someone not with you now. And when you think about these people, God is saying to Jeremiah, I'll return them to you, and not one will be missing. Not one will be missing. What a wonderful promise. And it's a promise that can help us find strength to move on with our lives and to find the new beginnings God has waiting for us and the other side of the losses that we experience. When we suffer the loss of someone, for a long, long time it seems impossible to be able to function properly. You feel numb. Someone told me recently it's like being on the outside and looking in on everything, but not being a part of it. Here are words of reassurance. Two things here that are important. And the first is this, I will bring them back to their homeland. Just because they're out of our sight doesn't mean they're out of God's sight. And the second thing is, because of that promise that God will bring them back, we can move on with our lives. God has a future for us. We need to move on. God has plans for us personally and as a church. But this is not just about promises God makes to all who miss someone, who is lost or scattered, who isn't with us anymore. As personal as that promise can be, I think it's part of something much, much bigger. I believe it's a promise made to all humanity. It's a promise made to the human family, to everyone. And you know, there are harsh words spoken here. Words of judgment against those who are responsible for scattering the sheep of God's flock. And maybe God has a religious institution in mind here. Because you know, religion can be a tremendous force for good. But it can also be a terrible tool in the hands of evil. Religion can bring people together and religion can drive people apart. Religion can love, accept, forgive, and heal people. But religion can also judge, exclude, condemn people. Religion can gather God's people and religion can scatter God's people. But God wants his scattered flock to return to the pastures. He wants them to bring them back where they'll be fruitful and increase in number, and not one of them will be missing. So that's God's plan, to, a plan to bring the sheep back to the pasture and to make sure not one will be missing. It's a good plan. So how will God do this thing? How will God bring back the scattered flock? Well, he tells us. The time is coming when I will choose a king, a righteous descendant of David, who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in peace. Hundreds of years before the coming of Christ, 
God revealed his plan to Jeremiah that he would raise up a righteous descendant of David. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Jesus is that promised righteous descendant, the one who will bring God's scattered flock together and restore their life as the family of God. Almost a year ago, we celebrated Jesus' birth and the angel's declaration of God's plan, peace on earth, goodwill to all people. And then we traveled with Jesus over the weeks through Galilee, where he loved people and healed people and welcomed into the family of God. To Jerusalem, where he preached the good news of God's love, but was rejected. To the cross, where he died so that everything standing in the way of God and us and each other could be set aside. And to Easter, where the joyful news was shouted that Christ is risen from the dead. And from there, the message was spread to all who would listen. The message of love and forgiveness, that no matter who you are or what you have done, God's arms are open wide to welcome his children home. And God will not rest till every last one arrives. And here we are now at the end of that beginning we started with Jesus a year ago. And before we begin the journey all over again next week in Advent, God calls us to pause for a moment and to ask ourselves, how have we done as those entrusted with the ministry of finding God's lost children and extending to them God's welcoming love. How has the church in Scotland done this past year? How have we done individually? Well, as bad as this virus has been, it has on many occasions brought about the best in people. I think we've become more caring, more loving, and yes, more Christ-like. I believe it simply reminds us what our faith is all about. Our faith centers on Jesus Christ. So beautifully expressed by Paul in his letter to the Colossians, Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God, the firstborn Son, for through him God created everything in heaven and on earth the seen and the unseen things. And God created the whole universe through him and for him. Our faith is that God is at work in our world, bringing his scattered flock home. And when all is said and done, not one will be missing, not even one. Let us pray. Lord of lords and King of kings, as we draw close to Advent, come into our hearts, we pray. Urge us on in our journey of faith that we know you in our minds, but also in our hearts. Amen. The hymn 436, Christ Triumphant, Ever Reigning.
Let us pray. Lord God, we bring our offering in various ways. Accept our offerings of money as pledges of our commitment and our faith, our commitment to the ongoing work and witness of Christ Church. Your kingdom is unshakable, and your reign of love will always triumph. So despite our anxiety and our complacency, keep calling us to be your servants here on earth. God of the journey, God of all new beginnings, we thank you for the promise of the journey. God of familiar landmarks, we thank you for helpful signposts on the way. God of real companionship, we thank you for stories of reassurance and of love. God of all the travelers, help us to be patient with those who still make mistakes. God of saintly wisdom, help us to learn from those who are patient with us. God of journeys, twists, and turns, help us to trust your strength when we are scared. God of our weariness, give us what we need to keep on going. God of our anticipation, give us the excitement of reaching the journey's end. God of our endings, give us the hope we need at the end of the beginning. God of all new beginnings, we thank you for your promise of our beginning again. Loving God, we are a pilgrim people called always to be in the move, seeking to come ever closer to your kingdom. So in our prayers, we pray for those who are stuck, those who are static, those whose journey has stalled, those who wonder if it will ever get started again. And we remember and pray for those who are stuck in despair. Loving God, we think of those who feel far from you, those who want to know you better but find it hard to get close, those who want to serve you but who are weighed down by a sense of their weaknesses, their lack of faith, the repeated mistakes. We think of the vulnerable and disadvantaged in our society, those denied their rights, their dignity, their freedom, their livelihoods, all who long for a time when things will get a wee bit better, but who've given up believing it shall ever be. Living God, so many in our world cry out to you, yet seem to receive no answer. Some because they don't expect to receive any, some because they're not listening. But there are many who are genuinely and urgently longing to hear your voice. We pray for those we know who are ill at this time, those who are going through a difficult time, those who have been bereaved. May each one know the peace of your presence. And Lord, as we continue to deal with restrictions, health issues, and uncertainty with this virus which is sweeping the world, bring calm and health and healing and hope. Be close to all who are suffering. Guard and guide all medical staff, scientists who are working for a cure. And we lay all our prayers before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The hymn 470, Jesus Shall Reign.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore.